Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. It is yours truly, Bishop McLean, and I'm here for this hour of power, the 1st of July, as we are continuing to sojourn through um, these peculiar and most difficult times. Uh, we are reminded of the importance of God's word, and we are reminded to remain steadfast in that word. It, it is uh, now... Uh, that what we find to be uh, the very thing that needs to keep us and needs to keep us connected to God is found in the word of God, always has been, always will be. And it's important that you continue to remain in that word so that you can know the will of God for your life and in this season where it is so important to know for yourself what it is God is saying to you, the, the child of God, the man and the woman of God, the call, the elect of God the ecclesia, the called out. It is important that we keep these things in mind. I was able and blessed last week, and I'm so grateful for all of you that were blessed by the word of God last week as we taught about producing uh, fruit in a pandemic, producing fruit in a pandemic. And I want to talk to you today uh, as we transition away from that about the steadfast love of God, the steadfast love of God. Uh, this is probably one of the most difficult times in the lives of Christians to date. Uh, there will always be a time to go back and look at um, the effects that this time has had on the people of faith and people in the world, period. And I'm sure books and, and theses will be read and all types of different uh, commentative views about how we navigate it once this storm ceases, how we navigate it through these dangerous waters. But I think uh, one thing that is very, very evident to all of us, whether that be uh, by anyone that is viewing me today or anyone that you know, uh, that this this pandemic, these uncertain times have caused some degree of stress and panic for a lot of people, for a lot of people. It has caused a lot of people to go back and, and wonder you know, what, what am I doing and where's my faith and am I believing in the right thing? And is God truly the God of my salvation? And is, is he truly God over my life? And, and where does that fit with me, uh, in this season? And, and it's almost at times like this where it seems kind of hard to imagine, uh, being able to be part, participants or let me say, rephrase that and say recipients of God's love. But it is very important to understand that God loves us one and all. And it doesn't matter where you are and, and how long you've been there, how broken you are and, and how uh, much strife you experience. The word of God is clear that God's love remains steadfast. And that's what I want to talk about today, the steadfast love of God. So what does it mean to be steadfast? Let's look at the definition of what it means to be steadfast. It means to be firmly fixed in place immovable, not subject to change, not subject to change, a firmness, any belief, determination, or adherence. And the steadfastness of God is, is very efficacious, and it is all throughout Scripture. We find that steadfast love is mentioned 196 times in the Old Testament and 127 times in the book of Psalms, all by itself. 127 times in Psalms are we reminded of the steadfast love of Christ. It is there in Psalm 6 and 4 where it says, Turn, O Lord, and deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. The love of God is steadfast. It is something that is fixed. It is something that is not movable. It is immovable. It is not going to change. And it cannot be deterred. It is a detriment. It is a determination and an adherence. And that is what God gives each and every one of us every day of our lives. He gives us his steadfast love. The love of God is what came and saved us. But the Bible says that while we were yet in sin, Christ died. You remember where it declared for God so loved the world. That is probably the epitome of his steadfastness and love, that he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever would believe on him would not perish, but have life everlasting. It is in this way that we lean and we glean 
on the love of Jesus Christ. He is a loving Savior, though he is a Savior that corrects us and, and will straighten us out. He does it because he loves us. He says, and to them, I love, I chasten it. And so the love of God is something that I feel like every person viewing me needs to feel. Every person viewing me needs to be sure of that you have God's love. If you don't have nothing else, if you don't have nobody else, you have the steadfast love of God. So let's see what the Bible says about this, uh, this love, shall we? And if, if we can even start uh, in Psalm 118, verses 1 through 29. And I will just uh, read parts of that in your hearing from the English Standard Version. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his steadfast love endures, how long? Forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord and the Lord answered me and set me free. This is David reminding us in what would have been one of David's most troubled personal times in his spiritual walk with God, that God's love remains steadfast and he gives thanks to God for making, for letting that love abide and letting that love remain. And, and he also sends acclamation and, and a uh, repetition throughout the house of Israel and the house of Aaron, that the people, the children of Israel and the house of Aaron, the high priest, that they would also uh, reverberate this powerful position that God's love remains sure. It is in Lamentations. I'm going to Lamentations chapter three, verses 22 and 23. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy never comes to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. It's probably where the songwriter received the inspiration for that great song of the church. Great is thy faithfulness. O oh Lord, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with thee. All I have needed, your hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. And so we understand here that the steadfast love of God never ceases. And I know that in this, in this time and during these periods, it's kind of hard to feel the love of God when you've got so much stress and you've got so much weight upon your brow and, and the yoke is heavy upon your neck. But you have got to remind yourself as if you get done producing in a pandemic, these spiritual attributes that are so necessary to the believer and to the child of God, that you also remember that the Lord loves me. He loves me. Guess what? He loves you even when you fall beneath his wheel. He loves you even when your broken heart won't keep still. He loves you. He loves everything about you. He hates those parts of us that we need to change and our sin. He hates sin, but he loves you and he wants to remind you of that love. And you have to remind yourself of that love. And I, I know that many of you have felt some kinds of way, some kind of way as it relates to your walk with God in this season. But it is absolutely essential that you remind yourself during your prayer time, during your devotion, during your time with God, that I do have the steadfast love of God, not just the love of God, which is powerful all by itself. For the love of God exceeds any kind of love that we could ever experience or lack thereof in this life by any human being. His love is, is continual. His love is perpetual. His love is given to us daily. And we can't pay for that love. That love is just something he gives because he is a loving God. He gave us everything he could give us when he gave us his son, Jesus. And I have to go back to, to that powerful text for God so loved. He so loved the world. He loved us so that he gave not only just anything or anybody, he gave his only begotten son. Can you imagine what it is to give your son, to give your child for the sins and the and the reproaches of the world and for many that would have never even believed that that's what he did. And many that doubt it, those that refute it, those that dispute it, that say Jesus never even existed or, or he was nothing more than a prophet 
or that he did not come to redeem us. There's so many different trains of thoughts and ideologies and theologies that are co-signed around the love of God and the existence of Jesus. But the very reason that he came, the very reason why we received him as personal Lord and Savior, and that is because God loved us so much that he wanted to redeem us from our sin, redeem us from our fallen state that we experienced in the Garden of Eden. He wanted to call us out of darkness and put us in the marvelous light. And it's for this reason that we have this steadfast love. And this kind of love that we talk about here is the kind of love that Paul writes about to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. And he talks about the very intrinsic nature of love. And that love is more than an emotion. Love is more than a feeling. Love is more than your hair spinning on the back of your neck or sweaty palms or getting weak in the knees that you can't hardly speak. Amen. That's an R&B song. You know that one. But it talks about in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, and I'm turning to read here. It says, and I'm in the English Standard Version, that love is patient and it is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable and resentful. That's not love. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but it rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. It believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, as speaking in other tongues, one day they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. But one thing that will never, ever change and one thing that will never, ever leave us, and that is God's love. And we are called as Christians, as believers, to do our very best to emulate that love. And I'm coming to you from a vantage point of encouraging you to allow God's love to come into your life, to love yourself. But if you're going to let the love of God come into you, you've got to love people with that same kind of love. Romans 5 and 8. Let's look at that. It says that God shows his love for us. And here we go. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is a powerful, powerful text in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. And I believe in the King James, it will tell us that he commended his love toward us. Let me make sure that I've got that. I want to make sure that I'm reading that. I want to read that in the King James Version so that you can see it for yourself and that you might be able to be able to grasp it from a different translation. Romans 5, and it's down at verse 8, and I am absolutely correct on that. It said, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, what that is telling us is that because the love of God was so powerful, because the love of God was so pure, and he wanted to extend that to all of his children, that he did not wait for you nor I to get ourselves together or to get perfect or to eradicate our wrongdoing. That while we were in the midst of sin, while we were yet slaves to sin, according to how the apostles wrote it in the synoptics and told us that you're no longer slaves to sin, but you are now recipients of the love and the grace and the mercy of God. It is here that he said that he showed, the word commended showed, means showed, that he showed his love for us that he didn't wait for us to get ourselves together. He didn't wait for you to come out of whatever that was that had you bound, whatever those chains and shackles were that had you and I totally bound, but he died. He allowed Christ to die for us because he loved us for no other reason but to reconcile us unto himself. That's Romans 5 and 8. That is most powerful and most necessary to know that I've got the love of God. And all of us uh, that can testify to that will testify that I've been there and I've done that. And I understand that the love of God found me where I was. It didn't always find everybody in, in the church and on the altar and in sacred places. It found you in the muck and the miry and he brought you out. That's what David said in Psalm, that you brought me out of the miry clay and you placed my feet on the rock and you put a song of praise on my lips. That is so important to understand that the love of God is more powerful than any sin, than any wrongdoing, than any mistake that you will ever make, by any failure that you will ever experience, by any dream that you will not see come true. The love of God 
is more powerful than any of that. And that's Romans 5 and 8. Let's look at um, Hebrews 13, 1, 2, and 3. It says that let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison, as though you were in prison with them and those who are mistreated since you are also in the body. And so you have to, that's talking about that same love. So you got to understand that we cannot be recipients of this love and not be givers of this love. If you receive this love, then you have to do your best as you grow in God and as you grow in Christ to be a person that gives that same kind of love. You want to give that love. You want to exude that love. You want to make sure that you show that love to your friends and to your enemies, to your kindred and to those that are strangers and to those that love you back. I've told you that sometimes love doesn't come back to you the way you give it, but you have to be okay with understanding what the real meaning of love is. The meaning of love does not mean that you're going to get it back, but it simply means that, that I have what it takes in me as I grow in God and as I grow in his grace to give that love back. And this they will know that we are Christians by the love we have in our hearts, one for the other. Uh, John 3, 16, and you know this, you learn this in, in vacation Bible school and in Sunday school, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, that's King James, but have life everlasting. You know that, and you know that you believed on him one day. And when you believed in him, that love, came into your life. And for that reason, uh, we thank God for that. Uh, first John 4 and 19. This is a very short text. First John 4 and 19. It says that we love because he first loved us. That we love because he first loved us. Let me see what this says in the King James Version. Shall we? First John 4, 19. And I know you cannot walk these scriptures with me because you're viewing me, but you can look at these later. First John 4 and 19. And, and it says simply, it's just as simple in the King James as it is in the English standard. We love him because he first loved us. Let's look at verse 20. If any, if a man say I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how then can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that we that he who loveth God love his brother also. And so you, you that goes back to the point that I just raised several minutes ago, that your love has got to be exuded. It's got to be poured out, not taken advantage of or mistreated, but poured out on those whom we call our brothers and sisters in Christ, the wayward, the sinner, and even those who we don't necessarily like or care for. You have to love them too. You got to follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man is going to see the Lord. You've got to know how to love people that are not so lovable. And that is the hardest thing to do. But as you're growing in God's grace and as you're maturing and, and matriculating through your Christian walk with God, this becomes something that becomes so important and so moving to the believer that that love comes from me. That And one, one, one uh, powerful statement that uh, the late Pastor Roosevelt Sanders used to make, that what comes from the heart will reach the heart, but it's got to come from a good place. Let's look now um, at Exodus 34 and 6. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. This is the Bible. And faithfulness. He abides. That's what he said in Exodus 34 and 6. That he abides. He is abounding in steadfast love. He is merciful. He is gracious. He is slow to anger. And he is, and you already know what that means. He is slow to anger. He puts up with us 
even when we deserve his wrath and his discipline. We deserve his chastisement, but he is so to anger and he abounds, abides in steadfast love. You already know what I've already told you what steadfastness means. It means it doesn't change. It's immeasurable. It is, it is so great that there is no measure of it and it cannot be moved. Not only does he abound in that steadfast love, but also in his faithfulness to us and the faithfulness to that love that he gives us. And unlike man, God does not renege on that love. God does not ask for reciprocation. He just simply asked that we would follow his commandments. He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. He didn't ask you to do this and I'll do that because he's already promised and assured us of that, which he, uh, what he's going to do in us, with us and for us. He says here, and let's go now to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, 1 Corinthians 15 and 58, be steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. That's the reason why you can lean on this love. It's because you are steadfast and like his love and your, your faithfulness must also be unmovable and always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in God, your labor is not in vain. You've got to know that. You've got to understand that for yourself, and you've got to stand firmly and steadfastly on that. Now, I know you say, uh, Bishop, what, what can I say to the things that come to torment and come to uh set me back a few steps or what, what can I say to those things that I myself will do? Because oftentimes the worst enemy is not that which is without, it is that which is within. And you say, well, I've messed up and I've made some mistakes and, 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 and what can divide me asunder from God's love? Is there anything that can pluck me out of the hand of God and cause me to forfeit the love of God? This is where Romans 8, 35 and 39 comes in so powerfully to be applicable to your doubt. And I feel that in the in the realm of the spirit, for those of us that are doubting, for those of us that are in, in a fearful way because we don't know what's going to befall us in this economy, we don't know what's gonna to happen to our bodies, we don't know what's gonna to happen to, to us as, as a person, but you can't worry about that. You gotta remember what Romans 8 and 35 uh, through 39 declare. It says, who? shall separate us from the love of Christ. And then it goes through a litany of examples of, of uh, ideas or, if you will, situations that, that could possibly think that it could separate you. But I come to tell you, it won't work. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, Sword, which is translated here meaning death. As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. In the Bible, in the King James, it says nay in all these things. But here in the English Standard Version, it says no in all these things. We are more than conquerors through him. Here's the key word. Who loved us? For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, people in power, nor things present or the things that will come, nor the powers, nor the height, nor the depth, depth, nor anything else in all of the creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is so powerful here as the church, as the Romans are being reminded that nothing, because you have to remember that there were so many different uh, things fighting against the faithful at the time this was written in Romans chapter eight. So the apostle had to remind them that you gotta be confident in the love of God. You gotta be confident so much so that you declare in your own in your own self that tribulation won't take away God's love. It won't separate me from it. That me being stressed out in distress, being persecuted, and I'm haunt if I become hungry, if the famine should strike me, if I if I'm naked, poor, if I'm in danger, or if, if, if death has come, if life has come, even celestial beings, angels, rulers of, of and powers and height and depth or any other thing in creation, which means there's nothing in the earth or under the earth that will be able to ever separate you 
from the love of God. And I like how it says here, uh, right here in the, in the B part of the text, for your sake, we're being killed all the day long anyway. We're regarded as sheep being led to the slaughter. That's what the Christian is. Every day being regarded as the believer that's being led to death one way or another, whether that's natural death or physical death, spiritual death or physical death. But knowing all of these things, I've already conquered. In fact, I'm more than a conqueror. That extends me long beyond that which has been applied here. And he says, I am a conqueror through him that loved me. I am a conqueror through him that has loved us. I, I want to, I want to take you to two more. And then I'm going to let you go for the day. I'm going to take you two more because you don't have to be long to be strong. So I just want to give you a little bit more because you have to understand that it is very important now that as we apply these scriptures, that you rehearse this in your mind. Because you better rest assured that as soon as the word of God is planted, the Bible says that the, the wicked man and the, and, and the devourer comes to try to eat up that seed if it falls on ground where, there, where the seed has not taken root and where it has not been able to take ground and germinate and grow. So you've got to rehearse this over and over in your mind and in your spirit, in, your, in the depths of your soul, that I literally have the love of God. And as long as God loves me, that's all I need. And when you have the love of God, the love of God will teach you and will teach I how to better love ourselves. Because let's admit it. Let's be honest. We haven't always done that which makes for the love that we should have for ourselves. And then we go looking for love in all the wrong places. And we go applying love through money and thinking that uh, we are loved if we receive certain gifts or if we don't receive certain gifts or things that we're not loved. But that's the devil is a liar. You've got to understand that love abides. Let love abide deep down within. This is an old song. He'll give you the victory, the victory if you let God abide. Let his love abide. Let God abide. For he that receives God receives his love. You can't say you got God and don't have love. And you can't say you have love and have no God. The two walk hand in hand. You've got to understand what that is. And I just want to let me go. Let me do this. Let me go. And let me just look real quick and give you what 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 is love? What, what is love? What is it? it, it it's something you've got to remember. you got to remember what love is really is. Love is an intense feeling of deep affection. It's a great interest and pleasure in something. Love is a word that we typically have used and misused and misappropriated. Oh, I love you so much. And you're such a loving person, but we can't love like God can love. We just simply should try to emulate and bring that as an example to a dying world. That's what we need during a pandemic. We need love. That's what we need during a civil unrest as we are grappling and, and dealing with and addressing uh, years of systemic racism and disenfranchisement of the black and brown community. We need love because love drives out all of this. The Bible says that there's only one thing that can drive out hate, and that is love. Only love can do that. It says here, let me give you, um, let me see. Let me go to 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 16 in its summation. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. This is Paul talking. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And as I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power that your faith may not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul says to the church of Corinth, when I came to you, I came to you proclaiming the testimony of God, not with great and awesome speech, not with great and awesome speech, not with deep words and with, uh, with, you know, lofty mindsets, but I came to you in weakness. I came to you that my message might be words of wisdom. And it was through the demonstration of the spirit and through power, not of me. He says, and this is how I brought that your faith may not rest in wisdom of men, but in the power and in the power and in the love of God. 
Uh, lastly, but not least, Colossians 3 and 14. It says, and above all of these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And above all things. You see, you got to be, you got to purposefully practice this. The Bible says, put it on. Put on love. And when you put on love, it binds everything together. Everything together in perfect harmony. So we declare love will abide in our families. Love will abide in us. Love will abide in our kinships and our relationships. Love will abide in our churches. Love will abide in everything that you set out to do and everywhere you set out to sojourn. Love is the, I like what the Bible said when it said love is the principal thing. Love is the principal thing. And when God gives his love, he gives you the power to overcome. And so I want to say this to those of you that are watching me as I prepare to leave you for just a moment, but I'll be back again. Don't worry about the things that you, that you are, uh, don't focus on the things that have hurt you and things that have brought about a terrible disposition in the realm of the spirit for you in this season. Focus on God's love. His love will keep. We just said it here in Colossians 3 and 14, that if you put on love, it binds everything together in perfect harmony. That's exactly what God would have you to have. Have the love of God in your life and in your kindred. And if you love the way you should, don't worry about it. God's love is multiplied to you, even when you don't love the way you should, even when we don't do what we should. And when we fall beneath his will, isn't it good to know that the love of God will find us, even in your doubt, in this time and in this realm, you're doubting so many different things and how things will work out for you and on your job and in your life and, and how, wherever you're needing things to work out. Don't worry about it. Apply the love of God and be firm in knowing what the steadfast love of God really means. Remember, uh, the definition of steadfast is to be firmly fixed in a place, not subject to change. God's love does not change. He does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And if you hit rock bottom, guess what? God will love you through it. God will love you. If you ascend, if you ascend to the highest plateaus of your life, God's love will be there. And if you should hit the bottom and find yourself in Lodibar, in Hannah, and Gomorrah, you have to understand that the love of God will meet me there. It is unmovable. It is not subject to change. It is a steadfast doctrine. It is a firm adherence and a determination of belief that God's love is just that. It's firmly fixed. It ain't just fixed. It's firmly fixed and it's immovable. Uh, there was a, there's a hymn that says, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry and from the waters he lifted me now safe am I. And it goes on to the refrain says, love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Focus on that. Focus on these scriptures. We'll pin them and put them in the comments so that you can uh, go back and refer to them uh, for your study and devotion time. Uh, just a few scriptures that I gave you. We want you to have those so that you can have something to refer back to. But seek the love of God. Seek that love. And when you seek that love, uh, work to make that love manifest. I, I got to give you one more. I didn't get excited. I got to give you one more. First John 4, 9 through 11. It says, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us. That God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God. Wow but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. This is my favorite text. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And my God, doesn't that just like a perfect little cake, a pound cake of cornbread that, my, that your family, that your grandmother and my grandmother might make, doesn't that just bring it all together? Let me read that one more time in your hearing. Let me read that again. In this, 1 John chapter 4, 9, 10, and 11, in this, the love of God was made manifest 
among us. That God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And the, it goes on to say it is in this love. I like how the English Standard Version proclaims this. It is in this is in this love. Not that we have loved God. It ain't necessarily that I've loved him all the way that I should have because I haven't. But that he has loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation or the, or the, the one that washes away or forgives or eradicates our sins. He said, beloved, if God so loved you and me, we also ought to love one another. And we will know how you love one another by how we treat, how we respond, and how we do each other. No one is perfect, and everyone is is absolutely subject to making a mistake and and maybe not using that love the way they should, or not applying that love the way the Word of God would declare. But that's the reason why God is the God of a new day and another chance and several other chances. We've been on a, on another chance a thousand chances ago. And so you have the opportunity now, and I think that's a good way to conclude, to make 1 John chapter 4, 9 through 11, the substratum of your very existence. Let that love abide. If we ever needed love in a season uh, like we have right now, it is right now. Love has never been more necessary. Just look at the news, look around, look at what's going on across the length and breadth of the country and even in the world. We need the love of God. And beloved, if you have received the love of God, let that love abide and let that love be shown, not just to the people that you like, but everywhere, everywhere that you go. Not just don't let your light shine, let your love, let it shine too. All right. I love you. I pray that this has been a blessing to you. Go back and refer to these scriptures. I read it to you, the English Standard Version, the Message Edition gives an even deeper and enlightening outlook on what is the word of God. In these texts, uh, King James Version, of course, you can never go wrong with that when you want to go back to the foundation. But I wanted to read those to you in the English Standard Version so that you could get it. Not only get it, but apply it and watch God give you the victory. All right, this is Bishop McLean. I'm signing off. I love you. And let the love of God abide. God bless.